Welcome. This is Dr. Michio Kaku, Professor of Theoretical Physics at the City College and the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. And this is Exploration. Every week on Exploration, we discuss the fascinating world of science and its impact on society. And today, leading off, we're going to summarize some of the top stories of the past week. Well, I was hoping to lead off the new year with some good news, but unfortunately, we have some bad news leading off in today's broadcast. First of all, scientists, NASA scientists, have been looking at the oceans. The oceans, of course, give you an average assessment of what's happening with the entire planet. You can't do that by looking at the rainforests of the Amazon or the deserts of Africa because weather is localized there. But when you look at the oceans, you get the average effect. And what people find is that by 2100, sea levels will rise a full 12 inches. And that could cause catastrophic weather changes around the world. NASA scientists also analyzed the South Pole. And they realized that the South Pole, well, it's heating up six times faster than it did 40 years ago. So we now think that the South Pole, which was once thought to be the bedrock, the very foundation of stability of the Earth's atmosphere, is heating up to the point where we might see more cracks more gigantic ice shells breaking off from the South Pole, and that in turn could affect your weather. And then let's say a few things about, well, outer space. Uh, the History Channel, as I pointed out last week, has a new series called Project Blue Book about the secret plans by the United States military to analyze thousands, thousands of UFO sightings. Well, reviewers have had a chance to look at some of the episodes, so we'll say a few things about how accurate is the History Channel's TV program about Project Blue Book, the plan by the United States military over the years to analyze thousands of UFO sightings. And then moving on, talking about the planet Earth, we'll also say some things about the pole shift. You know, some people think that the North and the South Pole will one day shift or merge or move and as a consequence destroy the Earth. Well, it turns out that the magnetic North is, in fact, moving, moving much faster than people thought. In fact, it's moving at 34 miles per year, much faster than before. It doesn't mean that hell's going to break loose. However, scientists are scratching their heads as to why the magnetic north is moving so fast. And then we'll say a few things about genomics and our human ancestors. As we reported on exploration, we now know that not just the Neanderthals uh, lived with Homo sapiens thousands of years ago. We have also the Denisovans uh, who lived in Siberia. But now there's a possibility of a third, a third hominid that coexisted with us tens of thousands of years ago. And this one was found by looking at the genomes, the genome of Asian people. By using artificial intelligence, by learning systems called deep learning, we were able to actually analyze the genomes of Asian people and find remnants of yet another inbreeding that took place in our family tree. And also speaking about genomics, how long are you going to live? Well, we know that the insurance companies have actuarial charts where they begin to estimate how long you're going to live, and they bet on it. The insurance industry, in fact, is betting on how long you're going to live and how accurate these actuarial charts are. Well, these charts simply look at how old you are and your habits like smoking and diet. However, what about looking at your genes? Well, it turns out that the University of Edinburgh is doing exactly that. Not just looking at your uh, smoking rate and how much you drink, but also looking at your genomes. And it comes out with some rather interesting results. Well, let's just jump right into the top stories of the past week. As I mentioned, I was hoping to start off the new year, 2019, with some good news. But it turns out there's more bad news concerning global warming. First of all, there's a myth 
often perpetuated by the skeptics, that says that for the past 15 years, global warming has come to a halt and even slowed down. So what's all this fuss about? Well, you have to be very careful about this because a lot of the projections about global warming are done by looking at the terrestrial weather, land. However, land changes every time you go from one region to another. We have the deserts of the Sahara. We have the lush forests of the Amazons. However, when you look at the oceans, you get a much clearer idea of what's happening with the temperature of the Earth because the oceans average average any anomaly in the weather. So if there's a hot spot or a cold spot someplace on the planet Earth, it doesn't affect the average temperature because everything washes out. Well, it turns out that NASA scientists are looking now at the most precise way of looking at the temperature of the Earth. And by looking at the temperature of the oceans, you can also predict sea level rise. It turns out that sea level rises are due to two basic factors. The largest factor is the thermal expansion of water. When water heats up, it expands. It expands at a known rate. And that gives us a very accurate average, average understanding of the rise of temperature. Second of all, of course, you have melting of the ice. I'll talk about that separately. So first of all, when you look at sea level rise, so the latest results are that by the year 2100, sea levels will rise an additional 12 inches. Now just remember that for every vertical inch of the beachfront that you lose, you lose 100 horizontal in inches of the beach itself. So this means that we're talking about a change in the geography of the planet Earth. And as the Earth heats up, it means we're going to have more storms, more hurricanes. First of all, where does the energy of a hurricane come from? The fantastic energy of a hurricane comes from warm water. Warm water causes hot air to rise, and the earth spins beneath it, giving a spiral effect, and bingo, you get a hurricane. And so we're going to see perhaps hurricanes of greater intensity because of the fact that the ocean temperature is rising much faster than we previously thought. Now, sea levels will also rise for a second reason, and that is the polar ice caps are also gradually beginning to melt. First of all, NASA scientists were rather shocked to find that by analyzing temperature from 1979 to 2017, sea levels rose by an extra half an inch during that period of time because of global warming. Now, they know this by looking at pictures from satellites and also pictures taken from airplanes. Now, the fact that the Earth is here, loss of ice in the South Pole has accelerated by a factor of six over the last 40 years. From 1979 to 1990, the South Pole lost 48 billion tons in one year. Well, it turns out that when you look at the results recently, it's now 252 billion tons of ice lost per year. And, of course, that loss of ice means more sea level rise. And, again, with the rising of sea level, you're going to have more monster storms throwing water into cities and, of course, paralyzing things like the subway system. And also sea level rise means that certain island nations will gradually disappear. And it means that, well, I live in Manhattan, and it means that Wall Street, Wall Street may one day have to have dikes and levees uh, surrounding it to protect it from rising sea levels. And so watch out. By looking at the temperature of the oceans, we get a much better picture of the average effect of how the Earth is heating up. Well, let's also say a few things about a story I covered last week, and that is Project Blue Book. Project Blue Book was a program that was started after World War II because of the rash of UFO sightings. And they had actually a scientist in charge of it who was supposed to, well, debunk most of these sightings. But out of thousands of sightings, about 700, about 700 still could not be explained using the known laws of physics and using the known technologies uh, that was found in the 1950s. And so we're at a situation where 
the guy who led the project, who was more or less told by his superiors to sweep everything under the rug, he went from being a skeptic to being a believer, a believer in the mystery of UFOs. And then the question is, now that reviewers have had a chance to look at the episodes, how accurate is the History Channel? Well, first of all, let's be blunt. The History Channel did, of course, use special effects to accentuate certain things, to fill in the gaps. Eyewitness accounts are often sketchy, often self-contradictory, and, well, that's where the special effects guy comes in. So don't be surprised if you see Hollywood-level special effects when you're looking at eyewitness accounts of UFOs. However, there's one place where a lot of reviewers criticize the History Channel program. The guy who led the study in one sequence is shown with the aliens themselves. The aliens themselves were, were died in a crash, and there he is inspecting the bodies of the aliens. There is no, there is no evidence in the record at all that that episode actually happened. Now, we should also point out that Blue Book was just the first, the first of several attempts by the military to analyze UFOs. And the attitude of the military changed over time. The attitude of the military at first was to poo-poo these studies, but then it changed, and then the military began to actually uh, encourage these kinds of UFO sightings because it deflected attention away from the stealth bomber and other kinds of experimental aircraft that were being experimented with at Area 51. And so, in other words, the Air Force actually went along with it and encouraged the mythology of UFOs because it meant that it had a way to cover, cover its own top secret program of developing these kinds of systems. However, one should also point out that if you read the internal documents of the United States Air Force, it does in fact, it does in fact realize that potentially UFOs could pose a security risk to the United States. And since the military was entrusted with our defense and security, it means that, well, yes, there were voices in the military that said that, well, even though most of these things are fake, some of them could pose a threat to national security. And so the fact that the government kept these studies going for decades, even after uh, Project Blue Book was shut down, is not surprising because the military was entrusted with keeping everyone safe even from aliens from outer space. Now, my personal point of view is that recently another batch of these sightings was released by the Pentagon. And some of these sightings look, well, they look pretty authentic, pretty hard to dismiss. We're talking about radar sightings by, by radar and by visual means of objects that seem to whiz across the sky, make gyrations that are unbelievable, and things that are beyond what we can do with our own aircraft. Well, personally, I think that there is a case to be made that a lot of these sightings originate from the Black Arts Division of the military. Of course, we had the stealth bomber, a bomber that was tested uh, in the desert to make sure that it could evade ground radar. But now we have yet another type of weapon systems being experimented with by the Pentagon, also the Russians, also the Chinese, and that is hypersonic drones. These are objects can, which can go between Mach 5 and Mach 20, that is between 5 and 20 times the speed of sound. And the main thing is that they are maneuverable. That's one reason why it's taken so long to perfect them. Now, if the United States perfects a Star Wars system, the Russians are not going to take this lying down. They want to evade the ground radar of a Star Wars system by making their missiles maneuverable. But that's the problem. You see, if you're traveling at Mach 5 to Mach 20 and you're entering the atmosphere, the slightest, the slightest vibration that is not accounted for can make the, your airplane spiral out of control and crash. That's exactly what happened to the attempts by the United States military. Uh, two years ago, its hypersonic program was actually canceled because of the instability of these missiles traveling at such a high velocity in air. Now, in outer space, of course, there's no problem with maneuvering 
because there's no air in outer space. There's no friction. But once you hit the atmosphere of the planet Earth on reentry, that's where all the difficulties come in. And that's why the United States program was actually shut down two years ago. Now, the Russians, just last year, Vladimir Putin boasted that they have perfected the hypersonic drone. Well, that was met with a certain amount of skepticism on the part of the United States. However, most analysts would say that, well, yeah, the Russians are perhaps a little bit ahead of us in terms of perfecting this technology, but it's a lot harder than most people realize. So don't think there's going to be a hypersonic gap anytime soon. We should also point that on the medical front, certain advances have been made in terms of filling out the blanks in our family tree. We realize, of course, going back decades ago, that we humans coexisted with, well, Neanderthals. Neanderthals that inhabited northern uh, Europe tens of thousands of years ago, along with Homo sapiens. We've sequenced their genes. And then, several years ago, the Denisovans were discovered. The Denisovans we found not by looking at their bones, but by looking at a tooth and extracting DNA from it and finding out that yet another, another branch of humanity coexisted with us tens of thousands of years ago. And now, perhaps a third, a third hominid ancestor has been found using computers. That's right. Artificial intelligence has been applied to the human genome to look for patterns Patterns consistent with inbreeding between Homo sapiens and yet another hominid species. And this forces us to rewrite the history of the human race. Now, if you see the movie, Our Lord of the Rings, you realize that humans in the movie coexist with dwarves and elves and orcs and all sorts of mythical creatures. Well, now we begin to realize that perhaps our family tree is a little bit like Lord of the Rings. Also, here's another question. How long are you going to live? Well, the insurance companies, of course, spend millions of dollars trying to perfect the black arts of predicting when you're going to die. They use questionnaires. They use blood tests, physical exams to figure out your habits and whether or not you're going to come down with cancer or heart disease. However, what about using your genes to do this? Well, traditionally, it was too difficult to do this because not many people have had their gene sequence. But now it's almost a fad to have your gene sequence. So at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, they analyzed the genomes of half a million people, half a million people, and then they compared it with the lifespan of their parents. And then they got a correlation between genes and habits and lifespan. Of course, this is not deterministic. You can't accurately predict people, one individual's lifespan. But on average, average, you can, in fact, make certain conclusions from this. They singled out several genes which seem to indicate a high correlation with longevity. And by plotting this, they then calculated that the top 10% of people with healthy genes lived on average five years longer than people at the bottom 10%. Now, we should also point out that they looked at the genes. This means they did not look at smoking, bad habits, being overweight, not exercising. And they, of course, will also affect your ultimate life expectancy. But what they did was to look at the genes to find out, is there something you inherited from your parents that could then predict longevity? Well, the results are still being crunched. However, we'll announce the results when they come out. We should also point out that in the future, this may allow scientists to one day find the fountain of youth. Now, let me explain. Now that millions of people are having their genes sequenced, It means that one day, scientists will take the genes of old people, scan them, and also the genes of young people, scan them, and subtract, and find out where most of the wear and tear and most of the aging takes place in the human genome. For example, take a car. Where does aging take place in a car? 
Well, it takes place in the engine. Why? That's where you have moving parts. That's where you have combustion, the buildup of deposits, oxidation. And that's where much of the aging is concentrated. Now, what is the engine of the cell? The engine of the cell is the mitochondria. That's where energy is burnt. That's where the the cell burns glucose to get energy to perform bodily functions. Now, this means that by looking at the genes of mitochondria, we expect to find errors, error buildup, because of the wear and tear and the combustion that takes place in the mitochondria. And bingo, that's exactly what we do find. We do find a damage. Damage to the genes seems to be concentrated in a few areas, including the mitochondria. And that leads us to believe that one day we'll be able to fix those genes. Because, well, what is aging? Of course, there have been many theories of aging over the centuries, but scientists are more or less converging on the idea that aging is the buildup of errors, errors in our genes, mistakes in our cells, mistakes in our molecules. The buildup, the buildup of all these mistakes eventually make the cells sluggish. They don't perform like they used to, And as a consequence of this, uh, aging takes place and eventually you die. In fact, that's why we die. Now, if you can reverse the process using gene therapy to fix those broken genes, then perhaps the cell can be rejuvenated and perhaps we'll have a fountain of youth. Of course, that's just a dream, but it's a dream that is based on what is known about science at the present time. And speaking about aging, you know the earth is also aging, aging right before our eyes. Look at the poles, the North Pole and the South Pole. Most people think that they are a permanent feature of the planet Earth, but no, they move. The North Pole and the South Pole actually migrate, and the migration factor is accelerating. Scientists were a little bit surprised to find that the North Pole, the magnetic North Pole in Canada is moving faster than expected. It used to move about nine miles per year. And so, in other words, if you have a map of the Earth, you have, of course, the geologic North Pole around which the Earth spins, but then you have the magnetic North Pole where compass needles points, and that's located in northern Canada. But it moves about nine miles per year. The latest evidence is that it moves 34 miles per year, much faster than expected, and we don't know why. First of all, it does affect map makers because the military and commercial shipping do in fact use not only GPS, but also the magnetic north, and we have to recalibrate it. We have to recalibrate the actual location of magnetic north. Now, why is it moving? It has something to do with the inside of the Earth, but sadly, we scientists are clueless as to being able to predict and understand the motion of the North Poles. Now, the North Pole and the South Pole will sometimes even flip. Yet We know this by going to Hawaii, digging right into the lava flows, and over the millennia, when lava cools down and freezes, it freezes the direction of magnetic north in the lava. And so by simply getting a compass needle and analyzing the direction of North Pole frozen in the lava, you can actually see as you go millions of years into the past, the fact that the poles have in fact moved. Well, they're moving again. In fact, they're decreasing in intensity. That's right. The strength of the North Pole is decreasing in intensity and one day may go down to zero. At that point, things get a little bit dangerous because a solar wind can thereby affect the Earth and bathe the Earth in high-intensity radiation. However, this has happened in the past. We came through it. Perhaps it accelerated our mutation rate to have so much ultraviolet radiation from the sun. But we lived through it. And if it happens again, well, we'll have to get protection. Uh, More than just sunglasses. And lastly, let me say a few things about my field, which is high-energy physics. It turns out that the Europeans want to build a replacement for the Large Hadron Collider. 
As you know, the Large Hadron Collider is this gigantic machine, 100 kilometers in circumference, built outside Geneva, Switzerland. It's an atom smasher that smashes protons together at a maximum energy of 14 trillion electron volts. And it discovered the Higgs boson, the last missing piece of what we call the standard model. And the Europeans want to bet on yet another, more improved version of the Large Hadron Collider, even bigger than the previous one. In fact, the new one is going to be about four times bigger, perhaps have an energy of ten times the energy of the Large Hadron Collider. And, of course, this is not cheap. We're talking about perhaps $27 billion for the machine. Now, of course, it's not guaranteed that the European Union is going to cough up that amount of money, but scientists are beginning to look what is called beyond the standard model. The standard model is a very ugly theory of the atom. However, it is the most advanced understanding of the universe. The standard model is what is called the theory of almost everything. We see no deviation from the standard model except it misses gravity. That's right, the other great theory of science, Einstein's theory of gravity, is not included in the discussion of the standard model. However, there is a theory called string theory, which is what I do for a living. That's my day job, working on string theory. And it predicts a new set of particles beyond the Large Hadron Collider. And that's where the future circular collider comes in, the FCC. The FCC would be perhaps a replacement for the Large Hadron Collider. It will perhaps discover dark matter in the laboratory. We now realize that dark matter makes up most of the universe. Most of the universe is not made out of atoms. Most of the universe is made out of this elusive dark matter. And the FCC, the Future Circular Collider, which would be 50 to 62 miles long, may in fact have enough energy to discover this missing piece. And it is a piece that is predicted by string theory. String theory predicts that all matter consists of tiny vibrating strings. The next octave of the string, we think, could be dark matter. And that, of course, could open up a whole new era in physics with the discovery of a new form of matter, stable matter, matter beyond atomic physics. And that is dark matter, which we hope to create with the Large Hadron Collider.